Hi, I'm Tim Berglund with Confluent. Welcome to Self-Service Data, available everywhere. So here we have the third principle of the data mesh, building a self-service data platform. This is about a problem many of us have faced in our work in the past. How do you access data in a reasonable amount of time? Uh, let's take an example. So there uh, is a new trade surveillance system being built in a large financial institution, and it needed data from 13 different systems. Easy, right? Uh, the company had a messaging system in place, so it could publish events from sources, and lots of them did, publishing events that, that other people could receive, right? So uh, while you could get a hold of the real-time event stream, there wasn't a simple way also to get historical data. It was a queue. Stuff just went away when you consumed it. And when you're starting out from scratch, you typically want historical data uh, in full. The initial load, uh, you want to get that into your new database and have all that state and then keep it up to date with a stream of events. So in this story, some of those systems had a feature where you could re submit a request for back population. That's fun. Uh, and have historical events republished for you, but most systems didn't have this feature automated. And even so, it's not like that's a pleasant way to do things. So you'd be sent a data snapshot directly from their database. So in a situation like this, like maybe you get a CSV file dumped on you and you know have fun with it. That's not what you do to a friend. Then you hit another problem. Uh, the event streams and the snapshot file have different schemas and different names for each field and, and all that kind of thing. This is all based on a true story, folks. So that made it very hard to get the real time and historical data to match up in schema and in time. So just getting data into the database uh, in a form that made sense for a new node in the mesh or a new application uh, took about nine months, all right? Uh, this isn't an uncommon story. It, again, it's, it's inspired by actual events. And, you know, you've probably seen something like this before in projects across whatever industries you've, you've worked in. So coming back to principle three, it's about tackling exactly this problem, getting data into your product nearly instantaneously, providing a tight team feedback loop so they can iterate quickly on any issues that may come up. Unlike other principles in data mesh, this is achieved through a central infrastructure. We're trying to decentralize, but not everything can be. There is a centralized, we, we do want centralized event streams and a centralized service for allowing you to discover and provision the data they contain. So this system needs to manage both real-time and historical data and make that data available everywhere in any database in the company. The process of accessing data and getting it into our database should be autonomous, or at least automatable. Just like microservices, the most efficient architectures let us get the data we want and execute it at our own cadence through this type of rapid data provisioning. And you can see how centralized infrastructure is going to be a part of that solution. And that centralizing isn't centralizing data ownership, data product ownership domain expertise, we know those things are decentralized. This is just an infrastructure layer. So consuming data from the mesh means consuming both real-time and historical data, potentially. There's two ways of doing this. The first is the one that I described in that trade surveillance example. So if you just want to watch the world burn, you know, you can do that, uh, where you get the, the real-time and historical data separately. And honestly, this sounds familiar if you're familiar with the Lambda architecture, certainly something that has fallen out of favor in recent years. It's the same pattern. Here's a system for the historical data. Here's a system for the real-time data. So you build it all twice. The solution to this is known as the Kappa architecture. Let me explain what that is. The event streaming platform stores the streams as events indefinitely. Destination data ports, the things that are consuming that data, can then choose to start with the latest events if they want or consume all historical events first. In Kafka, we can handle this by doing two things. First, you're gonna set the topic to have infinite retention, so it's got all the history of everything. And then by resetting our consumers back to offset zero uh, to start at the, the beginning of the topic to get all of the data in the topic right from the start. Compacted topics can also be used as an optimization in some cases to reduce the amount of time it takes to load that initial snapshot. Now, that is going to uh, eliminate historical data, so this is for cases where you truly don't want it. Now, if you use something like Confluent Cloud, which has a more efficient mechanism for infinite topic retention, you can store those very large data sets indefinitely in a pretty price efficient manner. So what does this look like in practice? Well, as I'm recording this in the summer of 2021, there isn't some product or framework uh, or tool that you can adopt that is an implementation 
of all of this. There's no one thing that says, okay, here's my, my data mesh and I, I learn this, like I learn Micronaut and I've got a framework for microservices or, or something like that. This is to be expected because this is early days, just like microservices may be at the beginning of the 2010s. And like microservices, the whole point of a data mesh is to be decentralized. So there really shouldn't be one tool. We would expect many tools to emerge, but there does need to be some single point you can go to to discover the information in the mesh. This can be a UI, could be a wiki, uh, that seems like an extreme case, but hey, uh, could be an API or something else that we haven't thought of yet, but it needs to exist. Just like microservices typically have service discovery systems to help you figure out where endpoints are located. Let's assume it's a user interface for a minute. A data mesh UI might look like this. You could type search terms and discover schemas. You could introspect the data flowing through the mesh, look at the various data types and values, and you can request that the event streams be joined and translated. In this example, we have orders and customers selected. One of them is a historical data set. The other is solely real-time events. A stream processing query, in this case using KSQLDB, then joins these together along with a pre-processing step that filters out the events we're not interested in, leaving only the ones we want. That's orders for platinum clients. We're you know, looking only for the, the high rollers here and deposit that in Elasticsearch for us to query. So there's a concrete example of a data mesh node. This is kind of an implementation of another pattern called the database inside out. If you're not familiar with that term, strongly encourage you to Google it and you'll get a lot of great articles and videos and blog posts and things and even small books elucidating it uh, in some really helpful ways. In this pattern, Kafka provides the storage layer, KSQL DB provides query processing, you know, transformation joins, the ability to create passive views, which we can then send other queries to. So storage, query processing, there's your database. And to be clear, that doesn't mean that there isn't anything called a database in your system that, that's, that's recognizable as like a, a relational database. Those still exist. This is just kind of construing the entire system as like one big giant custom distributed database. Anyway, both of those things provide an implementation which can manipulate the events that are held inside the central event streaming platform, that, that central data mesh, and materialize them either as events or as a queryable view of current state. This point really matters as the mesh grows. Imagine that the data mesh becomes global with different nodes that span continents where delays are significant and, and maybe connectivity is, is less reliable in some cases, probably still pretty good, but you know, different than inside a data center. Like in this example, we have a destination data port on the left, which has two types of interfaces that make the data in the mesh accessible literally globally across the planet. That first interface uses events. That's the one at the top. The data port decides what data it's interested in, submits it to the mesh, and the mesh pushes the events into the data port as they become available. Those events can then be persisted by the data port in whatever way suits them best, say into a database, S3, or whatever it might be. The second implementation is query-based rather than event-based. Here we tell the data mesh to materialize a view for us because that's what we need. We don't want a, a sequence of events. We want something that we can, we can look up but with using a key. For example, we might materialize a view of orders that are for this particular customer, maybe queryable by an order ID or by a customer for that matter. We now interact with the mesh using a request response paradigm in that second case. We send the mesh a question and we get an answer. That's kind of how queries work. Finally, when a global data mesh is implemented with Apache Kafka, the mesh is really one logical cluster made from many physical ones spread around the globe. While the data product can use the mesh to send data to or receive data from, uh, if it's playing the role of a destination port, it typically can't use the underlying Kafka implementation as that sits under central control. Instead, it should use its own Kafka instance. This pattern is simple to implement on the cloud using systems like Confluent Cloud, where using uh, marginal or additional standard clusters, that's, standard, that's clusters of the standard type, not basic, not dedicated, but standard. Uh, those extra standard clusters introduce very small marginal cost. So that's the third principle of 
data mesh, making data available everywhere in a self-serve manner, including, I hope, enough implementation detail to start to make this concrete. There are, when it comes to data mesh, there are abstract principles that you really need to just kind of beat into your mind. But if it's all abstract, it stays kind of magical. And I don't want that. I want you to realize, no, 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 these are messages. They get produced in, into Kafka topics and consumed from them. It's a real thing. And I hope we've started to make that feel real here. In the next module, we'll dive into the fourth and final principle as we explore federated governance.